Hello, and welcome to Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. My name is Richard Hara, I'm your host, and I'm pleased to have here today Molly Carmel. Molly, welcome. Hi. Ms. Carmel is the founder and director of the Beacon Program, specializing in the treatment of weight management, eating disorders, and addictions. She has extensive experience utilizing DBT for substance users and eating disorders, and has completed the advanced intensive training in DBT with Behavioral Tech LLC. Before creating the Beacon, Ms. Carmel also created Greenlight, a successful weight management program at the Wilkins Center in Greenwich, Connecticut, and at Webster Wellness Professionals in St. Louis, Missouri. Ms. Carmel's work has been featured on The Today Show, The Dr. Oz Show, Dateline NBC, Anderson Cooper 360, and Extreme Makeover, as well as in People Magazine and the Los Angeles Times. She received her bachelor's degree in social work from Cornell University and her master's degree from our own Columbia School of Social Work. So welcome, Ms. Carmel, to Social Impact Live. Well, great to be here. Thank you. Um, so reading your bio and, and, and thinking, right, uh, you were here at the School of Social Work, and then years later, you're, you're on the Dr. Oz show. How does that happen? <laughs> I know, well, I think through a series of luck, um, one of the things that isn't in my bio is that probably like my second year uh, out of Columbia, I was working at Phoenix House. I was working mm. in addictions. And, you know, this thing that I do is like, it's really a part of my path. And I've been passionate about treating food and weight disorders my whole career. And I really couldn't find the path to it. Um, so I went into addictions. To me, it felt the closest. I didn't find eating disorder treatment to be sufficient in what I wanted to be doing. I went into addictions. and within knowing people in that field, I was recruited to start the first ever therapeutic boarding school mm. that addressed adolescent obesity. So when I was about 25 years old, I was recruited to the Central Valley of California. Okay. And, um, and largely because I followed my passion, and I think largely because I came with a, a really solid education, and maybe because I was willing to move to the Central Valley of California. Mm. And I started this, um, I started that, that program there, and that's really where this part of my career took off. It's where I started my training in behavioral weight management, was able to synthesize some of the other parts of the work that I think are essential in treating food and weight disorders. Okay, wonderful. So you're well-traveled. Uh, well, um, <laughs> yeah, Paul Fresno, well-traveled. Okay. I absolutely am. All right, um, <laughs> and uh, so you, you've worked as a clinician, you've developed programs, yeah. right? Yeah, I've and, been a and program developer since I was 25. Yeah, yeah and, and, uh, uh, and also um, uh, a book author. I understand that you have a book coming out at the end of this year. I do. I have a book out uh, December 31st, okay. so New Year's Eve, drop the ball, read the book, <laughs> okay. and uh, with Penguin Random House called Breaking Up with Sugar. It's, I mean, talk about beyond my wildest dreams, and, you know, without my career, I wouldn't be able to write it, so okay. it's well, really exciting. We'll definitely be hearing more about it, I'm sure, and also I understand there may be some promotions associated um, with pre-ordering, so yeah, yeah. wink, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> wink, um, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> we'll get that information to you um, a little bit later on, but yeah, I, I you know, I'm, I'm just, it's just fascinating about um, how you've sort of uh, specialized right in in DBT yeah. as as part of your clinical training and how you've taken principles from that modality and and use them in in your work with weight management and so yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, I'm and I need to say I'm obsessed with DBT. I I think that um, and I'm really well trained in it. I was lucky enough when I was. Um, I guess about 12 or 13 years ago, I was gifted by, when I was working at the Wilkins Center, I was gifted to spend about five days with this fantastic DBT clinician, Alan Frizzetti, is very well known as, a couple, as the couples therapist. And mm. when he started to, and I took it a little bit uh, at Columbia, but it was a different time. It was before there was a lab here. I'm a little, I'm a little older than I look, maybe. Um, but what I started to understand about DBT, and, and, and the research suggests this as well, is that you know DBT is, is well utilized for a lot of things that maybe people don't know about, including eating disorders and addictions. Mm -hmm. But to me, um, the idea that it's a, re it's like a, it's a principle-based treatment with protocols, right? Which means like, in my experience being a clinician, I never know what I'm walking into, right? Mm. So if I have to follow like this exact regime all of the time, I'm, mm. I'm not probably not going to be 
as effective as a clinician. And the other thing that I deeply love about DBT, maybe the most of all, is how incredibly humanizing it is, how DBT has agreements like this is a relationship between two equals, and this idea of of really being like a change oriented. I almost sometimes think of myself like as a consultant someone hires to mm. get a job done with them. But that with these um, validation techniques and of course, you know, I don't know if you all know this, but um, you know, DBT is made for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and incredibly effectively, that research, you know, we can go read that all day. There's nothing, nobody does research like Marshall Linehan, okay. right? But to me, with food and weight disorders and eating disorders, the, the diet culture, right? These diet cultures making promises to people who have, you know, effectively like a, a diet is maybe somebody who needs an aspirin, right? But mm. if you have an eating disorder or a food addiction, you need like a Cipro, right? And so a lot of people are here eating aspirin over and over, wondering why they're not getting better and, and having people make like sincere promises. Mm. And DBT, we would call that chronic invalidation. Okay. Right, so there's a piece of the work in DBT that I think is is a no-brainer in treating eating disorders and food addictions okay. because it's made to treat chronic invalidation. People who come in my office are certainly not diagnosed BPD by any way, but they come with a lot of those symptoms as a function of yeah. the diet culture. So I, that's maybe something that maybe I don't understand about DBT. I, 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 I know that it's obviously got a behavioral component to it. Yeah. Uh, I know that it was developed to help treat um, uh, borderline personality dis disorder, um, but it, you know, it has components, right? And, yeah. and there's mindfulness and there's yeah. emotional regulation, yep. uh, et cetera. Uh, but what, what is it that's Dialectical. I, I'm, 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 it's an interesting. So yeah, I, what it's, is that it's piece? to say like so when Marsha was creating the treatment, she was just there to cure suicide, right? Like yeah. she's just like I'm going to cure suicide. And when she tried change strategies, and she would say, okay, like here's how we're going to fix you. Okay. Her her be her um, beta testers were like, excuse me, do you understand how hard this is for me? And so Marsha was like back to the drawing board, you know? And then she would go in and she would do like a more validation, kindness, wow, this must be so hard, like really validating. And people would say, oh my God, don't you understand how badly I wanna change? Mm -hmm. Right, and so Marsha, I think, came to this conclusion and said, wow, we, we need to find synthesis between helping people change and using validation to get them there, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of principles within this validation part of DBT that I think is what gets the really gets people over the line of change mm -hmm. is is having an incredibly validating therapist and all these other techniques i mean there's a whole manual just in the validation techniques of this okay so your premise is that i mean weight loss and and everything that we talk about with regard to obesity being an epidemic yeah. in american society yeah. today uh, is is sort of similar to this this kind of dynamic that people are trying to do things but they're not being validated or well i think i mean first of all if you want to talk about the gr a, a great two opposing ideas okay. uh, uh, in addiction in food and weight disorders which would be i really really want to change and i really really don't want to change right mm -hmm. i really really want to not be um, caught up in an eating, dis eating disorder or food addiction, but I really don't want to stop eating or throwing up or doing whatever you're doing. I mean, that's a, that's a real pickle, wouldn't okay, you say? Okay, sure. And so what DBT suggests is that we, we help find synthesis within these two ideas, that there's truth to both of those sides. And that's what a true dialectic is, is that we honor that there are truth, and part of validation truly is honoring that there is truth to both of those ideas and that it is really hard. To make a change. And DBT can help by doing what? Well, DBT, you know, certainly validation is not going to get somebody right. well. It's just going to push them over the edge. And, you know, something I, I love about Marsha uh, is that she always makes this assumption. Marsha Linehan, the founder of DBT, uh, the treatment creator. And, um, but this idea that people really have a skill deficit, right? Okay. And so, and gosh, you know, if you failed at a million diets, you know, you're going to really take that personally. You're going to really think that you're the problem, mm. right? And and I would say, by the way, like the diets are the problem. You probably didn't take the Cipro when you need, when you were taking Advil right. the whole time. But, but also I think there's a, a tremendous skill acquisition that needs to happen both in understanding what to eat. There's a lot that happens when we have to recover in 
in, um, in being able to meal regulate and finding out what foods work and what foods don't. But here's the here's the real kicker in my in my opinion. I think of this with all with all substance with all addiction. Mm -hmm. The thing that you're doing can no longer be the coping skill, right? So with food and weight disorders and certainly with binge eating, we have to take that off the table as a coping skill, right? Which is like being a hole in the donut at the end of that, right? So it's like if I want to change my relationship with food and all I'm doing is using food to cope. To cope, right. I have to find a whole new way to live because Mar Marshall Linhan actually says one of my favorite things that she says. She says, you know, as long as the problem behavior is still being utilized, change is impossible. Okay. And so that's a big piece is learning how to tolerate life without using food. That's probably the biggest part of it, right? So is it possible to just take away that coping mechanism and then put in another one? Or do you need to put another one in first so that then you can... It's such a good question. I, I th What I usually say, I mean, yes and no. I, or okay. DBT, as we would say, it depends, right? right? It depends who you are, and it's okay. a bit of a snowflake question. But... I think the thing about the skill, and by the way, there's two chapters in my book devoted entirely to this. The first one, you know, if you want to see, a lot of people who have been around the way in dieting or making any change, like it's not unfamiliar that you would say, hey, why don't you journal instead of taking drugs, okay. right? right? But people find that really invalidating. Like you clearly don't understand how bad my pain is. But mm. when we're at this turning point that says, well, you can't change unless we figure out something to do differently. Okay. We have to sell that to people. I think, right. by the way, being a therapist is really being like, a negotiator and a salesperson, mm. right? And a validator. Like, I, I think that those are really the three skills that we need. And so well, what I talk about in my book is like, we have to date these skills, like literally take them on dates. Because if I'm in my kitchen and I'm like ready to go on a binge, it, like there's no way I'm using a skill that I don't know works, Okay. right? So we have to, in DBT language, you know, we would say something more like, we have to be able to, we have to practice skills when we're not activated mm. because then we'll practice them when we're activated. If I don't right. know that I love listening to music when I'm calm, I'm certainly not trying it when I'm about to reach for a cookie. You know okay. what I mean? All right. Um, I just want to jump in here and, and remind our viewers that we will have a Q&A um, during the last 10 minutes of the program. So uh, think about your questions yeah. and you can write them in the chat box Get them and, ready. and then we'll have them here. So, okay. So the title of your book is Breaking Up With Sugar. So it seems to me that you're talking about a relationship, yeah. okay? And, and that a lot of what we do is predicated on interpersonal relationships, yeah. right? And, and, mm -hmm. and so on. So how does, how does that work as far as? Well, so, you know, by the way, there's only two relationships we need to have in this lifetime, okay. right? And one is with food and one is with ourselves. Otherwise, it may be like air, but still, right? But I think that there's this, really fascinating piece of this, which is like, when we're making this into like a destination and a diet, like a diet's not solving a relationship problem, oh. right? And so one of the big pieces of DBT that I use in this book is, um, is in the DBT for substance use, and it's called dialectical abstinence. And it's an interesting way that people who are, have chronic diet problems behave with food. I mean, it's, this is not a clinical term, but it's like very crazy, right? Because Somebody wakes up and they say, oh, it's Monday, I'm going to go on my diet, it's going to be amazing, and they go to work, and there's donuts on the table, and they take a bite of the donut, and their reaction, you know what their reaction is, right? What? Like, they just throw caution to the wind, like, oh. oh, I had the bite of donut, like, game on, like, you know, and then it's like pasta for lunch and frozen yogurt for dinner, and, and the, it goes on and on and on, and it would be like if you got a flat tire in your car, and you got out of the car, and you sliced all four tires, mm, okay. and you left the car in the middle of the highway, right? And so, by the way, if you want to know trauma, I mean, right? I mean, if you want to know chronic invalidation, it's like, that is self-harm, in my opinion, right? Okay. If you're cr chronically doing that to yourself, people have really lost trust in themselves. But yeah. more importantly than that, from a relationship perspective, right. it's like, there's no relationship in anybody's life that would work if the first thing they did when something went wrong is to quit the relationship. Like, you ever have a hard day at work? Sure. Are you like, I'm out of here, Columbia. Nice <laughs> to know. <laughs> like, right? 
Uh, right. We have ideas right, right. about that for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But, you know, there's not none of us that are like. You got to make the relationship work, or at least try to make or it make work. Make a right? corrective action plan. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Try not to do it again. Yeah. Get right back on. Have a little meeting with your staff. So sugar's not the enemy per se, well, right? Well, sugar is it the is enemy. The, okay. <laughs> for some of us, actually, I'm not here to diagnose. Okay. But so there's a quiz in the book. You decide. All right. But. From a chemical perspective, uh, there are people who have conditions with sugar that are, are will match cocaine. That you will take that DSM five right. quiz and you will win. I mean, I I'm in recovery from a sugar addiction. I'm a twelve out of twelve on that thing. And there's mm. a Yale food addiction scale. I mean, this book is. I love DBT. I love science. I'm well trained. This book is rooted in science. There is this long of a, of the end notes of this book. Yeah, I was you know going to ask about the empirical evidence yeah. and and sort of testing. Um, you know, I'm you an are... old gener. I'm of the old generation, and I think truly, like being really rooted in DBT, mm -hmm. has almost uh, trained me to say, well, what does the research say? Well, what is the re I, none of there's very very few independent ideas in this book. Mm -hmm. I, I really like to rely on what people have done before, and frankly, my clinic in New York City, we've been practicing this for six years, and so and had pretty remarkable success with people who otherwise were not getting well. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to remember the. The idea in eating disorders, and, and let me tell you one other thing about eating disorders and food and weight disorders. There is no evidence base. Hmm. I mean, that's the, so we're all just doing our best, okay. right? But there's a huge belief in this eating disorder field that uh, that moderation is the only way. And I always say, like, one way runaway, right? We don't actually know what works. Okay. And so I'm just introducing a new model, right, which would be a, I would say like a harm reduction abstinence model. Like we try not to, it's what dialectical abstinence says. It's like we try not to do it ever, mm. but if we do it, we get right back on track, right? Like okay. like we do in all relationships, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and again, going back to DBT sort of, uh, being created in response to the failure of traditional therapies, yeah. right? Um, yes. f uh, with with patients with borderline personality disorder. I mean, is at some level are you are you looking at food addiction and um, you know these these weight men as as something rooted in people's personality or? Oh, I don't. I don't think so no. at all. Okay. But no, no, no. But I do think that I'm offering a different paradigm because, for in my own experience, in the first ten pages of that book is my own experience. Like, I couldn't find a place that worked. Mm. And so, like Sebastian and the Little Mermaid, I was like, you "Want something done right? You got to do it yourself." You know. And right. so, a lot of this has been informed by my own experience, but my own experience informed by empirical evidence. What I know works: taking from DBT, taking from an addictions model, taking from a harm reduction model. But I don't think it's a person, I mean, I think it's a, I think like all addiction, I think yeah. it's biological, I think it's psychological, I think it's the nature of the person, I think it's the nature of the environment, I think it's the nature of the substance, I think it's the perfect storm. The only thing I can say about food that is different than traditional addiction is that it impacts the nervous system, like dopamine, but it also is, tr and this is where our the real epidemic comes in. It's it's a it's a function of the endocrine system too. So, people who may not even be so neurologically addicted okay. have endocrine, you know, with a, with insulin and cortisol, and it, it really looks addic this addiction is it's tough in that way. So, the treatment. Um, I mean, the clients that you see, uh, we have some idea of what the content of the work might be like but I mean how long does it take uh, what, uh, what do you right? and I'm sure it varies by individual but <laughs> yeah. what, what are what are people looking at because it seems like a, a, a big task here I the thing is, it's such an interesting question because it's a it's a it's how long does it take to heal a relationship I don't right no I think okay. that that's sort of what we get into with diet culture mm. um, uh, right? right I mean it's like right. I mean, I think it takes, I, well, and by the way, it's not what I think. The research says, right, mm. it takes 66 days to get some level of uh, automacy, right, for our brains to sort of say, oh, okay, I can do this day in and day out. Okay. But the truth is with any addiction, it's like it, the answer is not when does it end. The answer is like, well, what does my recovery look like? Step how by do, step. And how do I maintain this relationship? Mm -hmm. And it's like if I stopped taking my blood pressure medicine and my blood pressure went up, it would be no surprise what I would have to start doing again. And I think that's really what I'm trying to say is that this takes a minute, right? Yeah. And, and this is like, 
getting into relationship with food and getting into relationship with yourself is the only answer. It's a very unsexy answer, by the way. Well, and, and developing the skills, right, to manage those thousand relationships. Percent, okay. thousand percent. Uh, well, let's, let's go to the questions. Uh, do the four steps of DBT as they are applied to bipolar disorder translate well to food and eating disorders, or are there modifications to the protocol? So I'm, I'm going to try to, hi, um, I'm going to try to answer this question the way I think it's being written, okay. and so apologies not, but I think what we're talking about are the four modules of DBT, yeah. mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, uh, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance. Absolutely. Um, they absolutely translate to, and what I want to say is that there actually is a DBT for eating disorders and DBT for bulimia. There's a book. It's great. My spin on it is that I don't believe in moderation. And I also believe wholeheartedly that in order to be in recovery from an eating disorder, you need to have a really good knowledge and relationship with food. And so at my clinic, The Beacon, we deal with food there. And so the way in, that we do it in DBT, which is where we have a target behavior and we have a diary card and all of that, we have people write down their food and, and we use the food as the target behavior in individual therapy and then adjunctively have skills groups where we take some of the greatest hits of the DBT. But I, without question, I mean, I got to be honest, I, I think that the DBT translates well to life. <laughs> so there's that one too. Okay, and for people living their best life. Oh, you know, a life worth living, as Marcia okay. would say. All right. Um, next question. Have you ever tried parts work, Richard Schwartz, with DBT? It seems consistent with the idea of dialectic, being able to acknowledge the parts of you that want one thing and the parts that want yeah. another, and then facilitating dialogue between those parts. So it's not. So it's not like love, great question. Uh, I'm really into this. I could be here all day, but um, so. That's not, con so that question is the parts therapy is not consistent with DBT, although it certainly smells a little like addic traditional addiction therapy, like calling something like the addict. Um, in DBT for substance use, there's a wonderful skill where Marsha calls it like the addict mind, the clean mind, and in the middle, the dialectic of that is the clear mind. And that would be a little bit consistent, I think, with a parts idea of like, oh, that's my addict mind working right now, or oh, that's a clean mind thought. Um, but, and, and I certainly um, use DBT as my primary uh, my primary use in the work, and I, but I pick, I pick those little parts work every now and then. So, mm. but so I think there's, a, there's certainly are similarities. You can find that, and in, and in the core of Marsha's work, wise mind, um, reasonable mind, emotional mind, you can be saying, oh wow, that's a real reasonable mind thought right there. So maybe that's not working for me. Okay, so. So I see, now I'm starting to see the dialectic, right? You know what I mean? A Hegelian kind of, you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Look at you. Is that what's, there okay, you go. Okay, it's like, I'm, you're like, we can, you're done. Trying we'll to catch, it. okay, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, sort of coming to that point where you're able to, uh, res I don't know if it's resolve or at least um, hold, you know, two different. Yeah, and I think identify choose. like, oh, look at that! I'm swinging too left today. Like, oh, look at that! I'm like, I'm really, really. And by the way, clean-minded mm. in addictions, right? Is like, oh no, I'm fine. Like, I can sit at the bar. Like, oh, I'm good. I'll carry the cupcakes to the party. Who? I've got this, mm -hmm. right? And that's uh, arguably, I think, in, especially in binge eating and in compulsive overeating, like right. that's actually the most dangerous of all, mm. right? Is like, oh, I don't need to have my snack. I'm fine because. Restriction always leads to binging, and it's an interesting thing. And to be able to identify, like, oh my goodness, my thinking is not consistent with who I want to be today. I gotta gotta move back over to the middle path there. Okay. Um, next question. A few members of my family um, have had weight loss surgery without any form of counseling beforehand. How can we get this integrated for people deciding on this form of weight loss to truly change their behavior so the weight does uh, not come back? I mean, that's a policy question, isn't yeah. it? I totally, um, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with that. Um, I don't know how we can do that, but I wish we could. I wish that people would understand that um, eating disorders and food addictions are psychological sometimes spiritual disorders and bariatric surgery is a mm. medical procedure, right. right? And so we want to treat all of these conditions as wholeheartedly as we can, as holistically as we can to get to garner the best results. Okay. Um, 
but eating disorder treatment for eating disorders um, they are evidence based and they are covered by insurance. Um, uh, some of them. Some of them, right? <laughs> you never some know, of them. right? Just yeah. like all treatment. You some insurance is uh, some insurance and some evidence based and some not. Right. right? right. Evidence based is hard to find around. Okay. Um, so maybe that's a factor um, in this, you know, sort of gap or disconnect in terms of uh, really comprehensive services being out there. And you know, it's really why when I created my model, um, I created my therapists all diagnose food. So my therapists mm. all do food plans with people under the supervision of a nutritionist because right. I felt like that's so many places to go and it felt so untenable to be able mm. to have that much time to go to and like and have the team together just in today's world so that's a beacon we do it a little bit differently i train all of my therapists in nutrition because well, for that reason yeah. exactly yeah uh, given that anorexia has little to do with food what does dbt do to address the underlying causes a great question i'm in love with this so Interestingly enough, there's a new, not a new, but there's a radically open DBT, RO DBT, that has been, they're trying to create, they're actually, the thing that actually has zero evidence base is anorexia. So mm. if you want a real, like, roll the dice disease, that's the one. So I think that DBT doesn't talk too much about underlying diseases. It's a behavioral therapy, right? Arguably, incredibly, um, uh, we, we, it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, I can't remember it, so I'm not going to waste our time thinking of my word. But we don't really look at underlying issues unless when we're sitting in a chain, we have to take a moment and look at them, right? And so if you want a more psychodynamic uh, uh, look at anorexia, this would, this would not be the treatment for you, right? And sometimes okay. there's people who even come to my clinic where I'm like, this might not be the thing for you be because of the evidence base is so... There is no one thing that works. Okay, so we're distinguishing that from uh, clients who come in with comorbid, you know, yeah. um, issues, right? Yeah. Um, it's uh, like a snowflake. Everybody's okay. so different. Okay. Uh, in your writing and publishing process, how did you adapt your clinical information into a book that's accessible to the public? I know. Yeah. I so this was like the most fun and interesting part of writing app because I think that what I come with is a bit of a ability to sort of like People Magazine up um, some of the research. Mm -hmm. And so actually um, a woman, Alex Wilt, she graduated two years ago. She, um, do you know her? The name is familiar. She's one of my favorite humans. Okay. She works at Beacon. Great. We're hiring. So if anyone wants to come work for us, please get in touch with me ASAP. Okay. But um, she is a, is a great researcher. And so she, she was my writing partner in this. Mm. And so she would be doing all of this writing. And so she would write it out like very clinically. And then I would like have to sort of read it and say like, okay, how do I right. make this like unicorns and sprinkles and glitter so that people will like want to read it? And it's actually, if you ever saw how that process <laughs> went on between me and Alex, it was largely hilarious because she would write something and say, oh, can't you just write that like a human, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> the way human beings talk. Right. And, but, so we just have this great banter together. She's wonderful. She's a great gift of mine right. from Columbia. So thank you, Columbia. Um, so... It, just the process of trying to just distill it into yeah, everyday I mean, language to be honest, about here's relationships what it, here's, that people can and here's what we did. identify with. I would write it in science, I would read it, and I'd say sort of like, how do I say this to people? How would I say this to a, a high school student? How would I say this to my friend who didn't get it? My mother always says to me, like, stop sounding like such a therapist, Molly. And I kind of have my mom in my brain, and I'd have a few ideal avatars, that's what we call them in writing. I have a few people I would be writing to, mm -hmm. and I would think like, okay, would this make sense to them? And yeah. largely it didn't. Yeah. Also, if you're writing a book, get beta testers, get honest people who are gonna, who care about what you're writing about. I had seven of them who would be like, that's terrible, or that doesn't make sense to me, or that feels invalidating. And mm. I'd be like, great, let's change mm. it, you know? Well, I, I'm always interested in, in hearing how therapists talk to their clients, so maybe this will be a great opportunity for me to DBT, sort of, yeah. uh, write. And, and, yeah. DBT talks about um, radical genuineness. It's one of the main validation strategies in DBT, so that's where I come from. I was okay. like, count me in. Um, we're, we're, I'm sorry, we're going over ah. um, five minutes. Um, uh, 
So please we're stick around. Our yeah, time we're together. extending I'm the time. I'm so excited. Just so we can get everybody's question in. So my apologies uh, for not keeping track. How does DBT address issues of body image and self esteem, which so often accompany uh, or are subsequent to primary eating disorders? Yeah, well, so here's what I want to say about that. Um, I'm not sure that it addresses it so directly, but here's what I know for sure. Um, it's really, 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 I think my second book might be about this, spoiler alert. Mm. But it's really, really hard to like, accept, or love your body when you are harming your body, right? And right. so to me, in many ways, and like, listen, I get body dysmorphia, I get all of it, but from a primary perspective, and from a, what we would say to DBT, a radical acceptance perspective, is kind of contingent on, uh, having really healthy behaviors and doing really esteemable things. Like the way we get self-esteem, frankly, it's a behavior. We do esteemable things to ourselves. And so I think that there's a base for self-esteem and body image work that says, hey, can I start to do the behaviors I know that are loving towards myself? Can I be able to chain behaviors that I know aren't and substitute in healthier skills in the way? But it's not a treatment in that way, very exactly like. So is that harming behavior? Like, let me see if I got, got this correctly. So it's, it's not self-harm. It's not sort of a, a kind of soothing or anything like that. You're, you're saying that, you know, well, that it's... To me, if I'm self-harming yeah. by binge eating and throwing up yeah. and saying horrible things about my body and body checking and all the things that come with eating disorders, right? Stopping doing that, the behavior of stopping that, is going to make my self-esteem much better and give me a shot at loving my body. It's hard to love okay. your body when you're harming your body, okay. right? Okay, get that. Get yeah, so that. it's an action. So behavioral treatment can work plenty on body image, promise you, and self-esteem, promise you that. And a little bit of cognitive therapy as well? Yeah, I'm just throwing <laughs> it in. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, Some all right. Some two-chair journaling. I'm okay. with you. I'm all with right. you. Uh, you mentioned... I really love CBT. Don't get me wrong. I know. I... I'm just here to talk about DBT. <laughs> so what's the difference between CBT and DBT in treating patients with this dis eating disorders oh then? Wow, God. who knew? <laughs> so DBT, I believe this is true, is like a, it's a form of DBT. It's, right. it's, it's under the umbrella of CBT, so yeah. we can all be calm about that. Okay. I think the piece of DBT that's very different is this focus on the validation strategies, the skill, the, the four modules of skills changing, like all of that. I mean, that's the difference of it. I'm going to promise you, if you're a good DBT therapist, you're bringing in CBT in the moment. It's not always, right. that's the thing about DBT. It's it's jazz, right? It's movement, speed, and flow. Like, you're really, you got to be really in the moment. So there's nothing like that particular, like, no CBT in this, no way. So get out, you know, it's a little bit more fluid than that. It's like being in a song. So you can try to work with some automatic thoughts and <laughs> do a little help. reality testing I, yeah, and things like that? Yeah, you will not get arrested by the DBT oh. police. I can promise you that. All right, I can no, promise no, you that. No, oh, maybe, maybe. Maybe I'll get arrested <laughs> well, by the DBT police for saying that. What do I know? I'll take your word. <laughs> um, three more questions. You mentioned um, relationship, food, and self, but what happens to interpersonal relationships um, uh, where at times it's not controllable, right? Well, I mean, first of all, I'd like to ask what interpersonal relationship <laughs> is controllable? Because right. count me in. I think that there is a piece of interpersonal relationships where it's actually, by the way, usually the thing that we are dealing with. So I actually say this, like I have done probably 10,000 chains on people binging. And I will say 999,000 of them are, pe are interpersonally based, are saying yes when you mean no, saying no when you mean yes, you know, going somewhere, being with people that are triggering you. So interpersonal, learning interpersonal effectiveness, and by the way, we could file that under learning self-esteem, is a huge part of living a healthy and life of recovery from an eating disorder. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, well, I mean, there's the uncontrollable outside, right? Well, life um, is, I mean, life, I mean, I write yeah, this in sure. my book, man, life gets lifey. You know, uh, we gotta learn how to, Marsha would say, like, we gotta play the hand we're dealt, right? And there's mm -hmm. nobody who's gonna get a perfect life, so better and, learn how to and, manage and that. And control within is also, it's not an all or nothing thing, no. right? So. Oh my gosh, I'd be totally screwed if it was, wouldn't you? Am I allowed <laughs> okay. to say that word? Um, what is the difference between this and sending a patient to Overeaters Anonymous where they deal with all types of eating disorders and addictions and offer daily support? Fun fact 
factoid. Okay. Which is that there's a research study that puts the 12 steps in DBT sort of parallel, okay. right? And so there are a lot of similarities. I will say that the number one thing is that DBT is like professionally run and in 12 step organizations, there's no, um, you know, talking through, you share for your three minutes and then you're sort of done and you have your friends. But there's a professional piece of this, there's an evidence-based piece of this, Overeaters Anonymous doesn't do the skills as exactly as this, but okay. nobody loves, you know, what I always say at Christmas time to my clients, it's like, no one ever complains that like, they're not supported enough, like more support, the better. Like, a okay. spe you know, the opposite of addiction is like, Connect connection. Right. So I love a good support group. You'll see me there. So there may be um, similarities in connect, but uh, overall, I mean, one is professionally done, it, right? Yeah, yeah. The other one's like a peer support group. Yeah, so yeah. They're all good though. Don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah, and can have some value for Absolutely. for people depending but on their it, needs. But what I also want to say to maybe answer this question is like, I actually think that if you're in DBT, go to twelve step because they're going to really be in such a great language with you. Okay. You know. Great, great. And and DBT also incorporates some group work as well. Oh sure, sure. A, there's sure. Yeah. A whole group component of it. Right. For sure. um, final question: How does the idea of radical acceptance work with respect to treating eating disorders? I love this question. I mean, how does the idea of radical acceptance work with life? But in order for us to have any level of change, we have to accept what's going on. And mm. the truth is that people are like, well, if I really accept this thing, then I'm really gonna go all out with my eating. But that denies the idea that we have wisdom inside of us and that when we really tap into this wisdom, what I always say is like, you know, when we're in our wisest mind, there is no overeating, right? Mm. There is, a, it doesn't make sense. And so radical acceptance is, after interpersonal effectiveness, this is the second thing I'm talking the most about. It's like accepting what is true and what you know about the true nature of your condition is the way that we start the healing. It's the exact, it's the jumping off point of the healing is accepting what is true, Okay. right? All right. Well, I hope that uh, um, our viewers today have an opportunity to read your book. Can we tell them about the website? Can really you quickly? just, yeah, please do. So here's this exciting thing. I have this website. It's called mybreakupwithsugar.com and you can buy the book on that website and then you get to get the first chapter of my book and get into this amazing Facebook group that we're in every single week and maybe get a session with me. Isn't that, I'm, wow. get on it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so if you sign up there, you get on everything and it's so exciting and I don't know if it's exciting to you, it's exciting to me. Well, we'll, we'll post information That's on, on our you. website and uh, so people have that available. That concludes today's episode. We'll be joined next week by uh, Columbia School of Social Work faculty member and university professor Nabila El Basel to discuss her work um, intervening in New York's opioid crisis. So once again, thank you, thank you, Ms. Carmel, for joining us today. Thank you all for viewing and see you next week. Bye. Bye.